So why don't we uh, jump in, uh, and Rob, maybe you can take this. Just level set us on, tell us in short order, what is machine learning and AI, and how do they differ, and, and get us on the same page. So for the next four hours. Uh-oh. Yeah, for the next four. Sibilance. Uh -oh. Sibilance. There, there we go. go. Sorry about that. I can't operate a microphone, but I can do machine learning. Um, so I, I'm responsible for machine learning for Google Cloud along with IoT and a few other bits and bobs. So I spend a little bit of time in the space. Um, I will try to be brief and vague enough so everyone's business can claim they do machine learning. How's that? Uh, not that there's machine washing occurring, but everyone remembers that. Um, first off, uh, machine learning is simply the idea that systems can be made to learn behaviors and understand intent that mimics people. That's a short version of it. The slightly longer version of it is, everyone else writes rules, the machine writes its own rules in a machine learning system. And if you think about the difference in scale, a short anecdote is the old world of Google a few years ago, we had a billion rules. Not kidding, billion rules. People hand wrote. Machine learning systems are replaced all of that for our infrastructure. Excellent, that's perfect. And so let me ask this group uh, across the board, is machine learning here now? We've had kind of AI summers, AI winters. Uh, they've all been talked about for, what, 30, 40 years. Is it here now, or is it still hype? Roy, you want to take that, or whoever would? I, feel like, yeah, I, mean. I think uh, it's definitely here. Um, the proof is in the pudding. I think we experience it every day in a lot of different products. If you're, uh, if you're looking at self-driving cars, if you're looking at the experiences that you're having as a consumer uh, in Google, um, and we're finding different ways to incorporate it uh, into software. Um, and so I think we're going to see it in more and more applications uh, if we're not already. I would say yes. And actually, the fundamental reason is partly has to do with the cloud and scale and the ability to collect the data that we have. So the way that machines are going to learn is by looking at how it's been done in many, many cases. And as you, I mean, so I know, for example, at Microsoft and Bing, when we double the amount of training data that we have for our ranker, we can improve the quality of the ranking by several points. So that means just by collecting more data, not even by improving your algorithms, you're actually doing better. And so part of the reason that machine learning is here now is the fact that we're able to collect that data across millions of people and billions of interactions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I would say, um, one interesting component, though, is that it's not here and not creating applications on its own. Um, it's actually a pretty big gap between the use of machine learning technology and creating a usable application that includes it. Uh, and so I totally agree with what Jamie said, that the, uh, the cloud has created new data opportunities. And of course, that's the, the opportunity for real innovation is the collection of novel data sets and interesting data sets. Uh, but the, the the collection of data itself uh, is a strategic process today. It's actually, you know, if you notice, uh, lots of large companies, including Microsoft and Google, releasing great libraries for people to use. They don't release data; they release code, <laughs> because the data is uh, one of the hardest parts of it. So, so let's jump in then um, to the the two companies represented between uh, Textio and Chorus. Uh, happen to be two uh, wonderful and fortunate. Uh, for us, uh, emergence investments. Um, but maybe you guys could talk a little bit about your, what your companies do and why you focused on a, a targeted domain. Not necessarily in an industry in this case, so we'll, we'll be clear about that, but the, the focus of your domain and why is that uh, important in this new world? Sure, so Textio is really all about changing the way that people write. You know, We started out with this premise that machine learning, the set of related technologies, is now at the point where if you have the right training data, you can know how your document will perform before you ever publish it by comparing it to other instances of documents where you know the prior performance, right? And so Textio's real application in the market today is around talent. So for any job post that you write, how do you change it? How do you write it so that you get more qualified people, you fill the role more quickly, uh, and you collect more diverse applicants to enter pipeline? So it's very intentional that even though we have a very broad vision around writing, we started in an extremely targeted domain, which is to say job posts and talent docs. Uh, we did that because A, we could collect hyper-optimized data 
that would allow us to kind of prove out our platform and predictions. There was a real problem that we saw for companies, talent is extremely expensive. People would really like to be hiring faster and more effectively. Um, but specifically in a domain, the kind of writing guidance that an algorithm might generate for job posts to make it successful is really different than what it might generate for writing an email to your boss or a marketing blog or any other kind of content you can imagine. So it's very important for machine learning based guidance to work that's actually going to make your document perform better in a quantitatively predictable and promisable way. You have to be domain specific. Um, so for us, that was really the, the part, and it, and it works, right? So uh, a couple of years into the life of the company, people who are using the product fill roles 17% faster than people who don't. And that gap is widening every month as the data set gets richer. Um, so one domain at a time is really the way to make something powerful and quantitative in the case of writing. That's great. Um, I see a lot of similarities with what we've experienced at Chorus. So uh, at Chorus, we're applying machine learning to spoken conversations and specifically to sales conversations. Um, and it's important because if you think about a typical company with a 50 person sales team, they'll actually have about 20, uh, sorry, 10,000 hours of conversations a quarter. Um, and those conversations, if you look across the entire country, you know, talking about Jake's market sizing, it's two and a half million folks supporting over a trillion dollars in revenue and a big chunk of a company's cost structure. Um, and those conversations matter. Um, what's amazing is that, you know, Kieran was talking about the data set. Um, companies are sitting on this incredibly valuable data set, which is the conversations that they're having with their markets. And yet every conversation, every sales rep is a silo. And Today, the only way that you can learn from those conversations and help somebody perform better is to have a human sit in on the conversation, listen to the person and coach them, and they're coaching from whatever experience they happen to have gained uh, in their careers. And so what we're doing is making it really easy for companies to capture this data, um, helping teams understand uh, and learn from what good conversations look like, learn from one another, and then feed the right piece of information to the rep uh, in a subtle way so that they can have a more effective conversation. Um, there's a lot of good reasons uh, that Kieran talked about uh, from a technology perspective um, that are absolutely applicable uh, to our domain. The part that I want to focus on is the human part of it. Um, when you think about bringing machine learning to market um, in the enterprise, it's about seamlessly incorporating yourself into somebody's day, right? Into a moment. And uh, it's it's one thing to develop the algorithm, it's another thing to, de uh, to collect the data. Um, but what we found uh, we underestimated was figuring out the right way to incorporate it into somebody's day so it can move the needle for whatever activity they're doing. And so even within sales, you know, in our first year we worked with 10 different customers that was everything from a high velocity transactional sale uh, to somebody who does the walk and talk with a headset to somebody who's sitting in front of a, a Zoom teleconference or sorry, video conference. And those workflows are different. And so you need to be very specific about um, how you build yourself into their day. Uh, otherwise, they'll just ignore the data uh, or they'll ignore the recommendation. Uh, and then the best recommendation in the world won't help. I want to add one point because something Roy said reminded me of something, a very important precept we have uh, in this space. Everyone here knows about A-B testing, right? A-B testing is where you compare how two things perform to see which is better. It's really old. It's actually really, really old. Like I think the core insight of companies like ours is that if your whole cohort becomes your A-B test ground, Right? You don't have to wait till after you publish or after you make the call to find out if you're doing it right. If you can be learning from the whole community of people who have contributed similar scenarios over time, everybody gets better. And I think that's something that the specific application of machine learning with collecting the right data, it, it changes it. It doesn't tell you uh, which perform better. It tells you what's going to happen based on your, you know, your entire community. I think that's a really powerful thing that hasn't existed too much uh, before the last few years. So that's a good segue. So I mean, one of the classic issues about machine learning uh, that I've certainly heard and I think is, uh, is accurate is that it's good at saying what is going to happen. It doesn't necessarily uh, help us understand why. So maybe uh, 
you know, Jamie and, and Rob, tell us a little bit about how do we get the why uh, out of machine learning to help kind of humans get better at what they do? Yeah, it doesn't tell us why, and it also doesn't tell us what's best or what's right. It sort of tells us what we can infer from the past. Um, and I think we end up with all sorts of really interesting biases in what we learn, actually, as a result. Um, going back to search again as, another, as an example, one of the things that we find is if you ask a yes or no question to a search engine, you're much more likely to get a yes answer. And that's because search engines spend time uh, they, when a person asks a yes or no question, they will give yes answers and no answers. People have just a natural bias towards yes answers, so they'll go click on the search results to give them a yes answer. Search engines will use that data, fold it in, and then start ranking the yes results higher. So you'll start, if you say, oh, do I have brain cancer because I have a headache, you'll get a yes answer for that. And so there's these very interesting, you can see patterns in the data, but you're going to see patterns about what happened in the past, and you're not necessarily going to see what's right for the future or what's right in a new environment or a new context. Yes, yeah, so I, I think they're just as um, try to delineate the problem space a little bit. Some of you guys will create your own models and there's few of you in the room that will enjoy the experience because the tooling sucks, um, but we're working on it. I think both us and Microsoft and is everybody gets the boats higher in the water. It's great for machine learning. It's great for all of us. So I'm a fan of everybody's product in this space. It's so early. Um, but again, most of us aren't. The other group is just gonna use machine learning provided as a service, and that's shovel ready. I wanna know what's in this conversation. What are the topics? It was it a positive or negative sentiment in this long form piece of text? Uh, was this voice call in uh, American English or British English? What variant, was it Wales accent or was it something else? All these things can be used to improve the model, but you're just using it as a service. So I just wanna get that out there. Now on the question of, why? Woo, that's a Ric Flair problem. Yeah. So if those of you follow wrestling, that's my wrestling joke for the day. Um, but the, the, the difficulty in debugging these systems is as hard as explaining the business why. Because especially if you're working in the deep neural network space, um, it, it's a little bit of a Ouija board trying to debug these systems and improve performance. Uh, for those of you in the dark art of auto hyperparameterization tuning, God bless you. Um, tooling will improve, so hang in there. You're not dead yet. Uh, but the, the why of way models predict the way they predict is formed on biases in the data. Um, please don't go to a natural language system and put in um, uh, anything about a societal issue. It will shock and dismay you at how these systems have biases in them because they get it from the internet. Where did they get this horrible from? From you, dad, from you. So how do we get clean data sets to train this on is an exercise in much as culture as it is computer science or mathematics. And that's part of our biggest struggle, I bet, that we spend most of our time pulling our hair out on isn't how do we do a better math technique? Because there's three things you need for machine learning quickly. Lots and lots of data, we hit that one. Less and less data over time, frankly, we're getting pretty good at this. Next thing is you need lots of silicon, and today it's gated silicon. So CPUs, GPUs, and specialized tensor processing units in our world, uh, FPGAs and other people's worlds, but there's a dark horse in the race and that's quantum compute, right? So let's not talk about that, that's further down the road. But in our world, those are the, the, and what's the missing thing? Well, you need good frameworks and good tooling and we're lag, guess what? You lag in software much longer than you lag in hardware. The get out of jail free for most of the hardware vendors who are making, making silicon for a living, their, their brass hope here is machine learning is gonna drive use. Well, that's in all our benefit, frankly. So compute, lots of data, or a little bit of data on an existing system, which is offered as a service, will drastically shorten the release cycles for these things. So why? Super hard. It's gonna have to come because we're betting business outcomes on this. It's no longer what was the topic of this paragraph, it's should I use this supplier? Okay, now that's a whole different ball game. So I'm gonna need the answer and we need a percent of confidence interval, and I better understand at least two of the three things that I think fed that answer, and, or those I'm not gonna bet a, bet a business on. Right. And the CEO is gonna ask, why are you canceling that relationship? And shall uh, I make yeah. the data scientist face back yeah, at the yeah, CEO? Exactly. Yeah, hmm. not, not gonna work. That's the data scientist face. All right, so let's all, I'd, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to hear it's wrestling, data science, it all works out. Uh, so what, um, let's look, I'd love to hear everybody across the, you know, across the line here, what do we think uh, enterprise software is gonna look like 
five years out, given this massive trend that's ahead. So, and as short form as we can, just the kind of the high order bit of what that's gonna what that's gonna look like. Gordon knows I'm really excited about this question. Um, I mean, what we're doing, what Chorus is doing, I think is just the beginning. Uh, if you imagine a world in which every enterprise is sharing performance data into a predictive algorithm. Look at what Salesforce is doing with Einstein, right? Make a smarter CRM so that I know in my company exactly when to pitch my sales prospect. And I know that because the system knows when I should pitch that sales prospect, right? What we're doing at Textio, I know exactly how to write my job post to get women to apply to my engineering job. And I know that because I've seen it work at lots and lots of other companies at the algorithmic level. So I think all across core enterprise scenarios, you're gonna start seeing just what started with security and firewall, where people realize that, hey, if I contribute my sensory data into the system, I'm gonna get better fraud detection. I think that's gonna happen everywhere, so. Um. I uh, am, I, I, as part of Microsoft research, I tend to think very far down the line. So what I say might be crazier than five years from now, but I think that we are going to start seeing the explosion of our tools, not by like exploding there's more, but in that they're gonna break apart and become little tiny pieces. And as we start learning what tasks look like and the structure in that task, we can start taking advantage of that structure. So we can start identifying pieces that are repeatable and we can learn how to do them. We can identify those pieces we don't yet know how to do and allocate them to people who can provide the training data for us and learn from that. Uh, we can also start allocating tasks to ourselves at times when we can perform them well. So when I'm standing in the back and have a little bit of free time as you know, the panels turn over, I might be able to do some really easy parts of my work, whereas when I'm sitting down at my desk, I can do rich, complex parts of my work. So I think this sort of ability to identify structure in our common tasks and um, allocate the different aspects to the most appropriate person or algorithm uh, to complete them will change the way that we work. And do you think, just quickly on that, do you think there will then, will there be software companies that are even more targeted, more focused on exactly that, those areas, or is it going to be one software company that does this micro task management? Um, so and, and it can be Microsoft, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Microsoft, <laughs> will, of course, no. Um, well, I do, I, I almost see it, it's sort of like, I imagine a world where, well, you know, we have to start figuring out how we can identify this, but I certainly imagine right now, in the short term, it's definitely verticals. And it's, I know how, I mean, you do this when you think about how you file your taxes. You go to TurboTax, and that's a vertical that's figured out how to, you know, make you for, fill taxes, and you fill out a form. Or if I wanted to write a will and I didn't want to go to an attorney, I could go fill out a form online, push a button, and I'd have a you know, sort of standard will. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of these verticals where we can start figuring out, um, there's a lot of interest right now in language and writing. There's a lot of interest in sort of personal assistant kinds of tasks. And I think um, we might have even a really interesting market around these different verticals if they can figure out how to play nicely together as well. Um, there'll be really interesting ways to share the tasks, share the data that's collected for the tasks. Um, across those verticals. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance if I ramble a bit because uh, I've got so many thoughts on this. Um, I think the first thing is all of the algorithms will benefit from speaking to one another. And so uh, I think that we're going to see a much bigger push towards platforms that start to um, integrate all of these data signals into one place. And so whether it's Microsoft with Dynamics and the operating system and your uh, you know, Microsoft's equivalent of Slack. Um, is it Yammer or something else? I don't know if there's, there's something else coming down the pipeline. Um, Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams, Facebook Slack for work. Slack plus IBM. All of these, all of these amazing platforms. But um, there's going to have to be a platform where all of these things come together because the predictions are only as good as the context they have, right? So for example, what we're doing at Chorus, we understand phone conversations. We get access to emails because they're stored in the CRM. Um, but you do have to take that into account to truly understand the state of a relationship or the state of a deal. Um, and so to the extent that uh, these organizations uh, can push the platform play, I think that's going to be one, one big part of it. Um, the second part of it is making sure that um, we truly understand where, the right, where to serve the right information in the right moment. Um, and so to Jamie's point about, uh, about breaking up tasks, I think we're going to find that there are certain tasks that we just don't do anymore because 
the only thing that we can do is not trust the algorithm, and the algorithm's probably gonna be right for 99% of people. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that we're no longer gonna be doing, and we're gonna be focused on the things that we are best equipped to do, and we're gonna find these algorithms um, surfacing the right types of information at the right time in the right context to help us get those jobs done. Um, and so what I'm really curious about is how all these different pieces are going to come together because the, the biggest challenge that I see, at least selling into sales in the enterprise, is that there's already tool fatigue. There are already too many different things that somebody needs to learn. You know, a new, a new person comes to the job and it's like, well, here are the 20 tools that we use for you to do your job and we're adding a new tool a quarter um, you know, and one of them is going to be coarse because it's really great. But I mean, there's only so much that you can do. Uh, so so that's, that's the biggest question mark uh, in my mind. In the future. Um, so I'll try to stick to the five-year budget, but this gets exciting. Hopefully you guys get the idea that we kind of like what we do. Um, I think there's two worlds that come together in the next five years, and I know several startups that are actually attacking this space. One is 90% of new data your enterprise customers face is unstructured data. They ain't got no idea what's in it, and they ain't got no hope of figuring it out. So they're gonna need it as a service. Whatever you offer them, it's gonna be as a service. You're gonna have to do things like auto schematization, auto discovery, auto insights, right click, point at a data source. Actually, these are phone calls. They're encoded in eight kilobit, and here's what's in them, and here's the accounts they're linked to. Those sort of services, hugely valuable. The other end of the scale on the, on the machine learning side, in our, our strange little world, I'm gonna get a lot better about intent fulfillment. I'm going to stop spending my time talking about predicting outcomes with percentage of confidence interval. I'm going to say, here's the nine intents that I've detected in this data. Would you like me to fulfill them? How would you like me to fulfill them? Insert rule engine UI. Don't insert natural neural, neural networks or wide models with a billion features in them, because I think our largest wide model is about four and a half billion features. There's no way that's interesting to a customer. Right click, automate, and cause those worlds to come together. That's easily in the next 36 months, not even five years away. Can I add one point to that? So the, other, the implication of that, and this was the other point that I, I forgot to mention, is I see dashboards going away. That's, that's the other thing. Um, maybe you know, to our friends at Domo and Tableau, this idea that all the data is going to bubble up into some number that an executive looks at and then acts on, I think to the extent that all of these systems are connected and we can close the loop with the people that are actually doing the work, um, that's, where, that's where the biggest leverage point is gonna be. Um, and so I see power being driven down into the organization and empowering more of the folks on the front line. Just so one small point. Control. This is scary as crap for large companies, by the way. Okay. What he just said, really Sorry. scary, really great for productivity but really scary. This is as scary as it was having databases out of the hands of the database engineers. Wait a minute, now I'm actually gonna have insights and information down to the people who can take action? Well, that's gonna flip my org structure in many cases. So that's a very interesting culture point. Again, the machine learning stuff is gonna lag the culture. So Jamie, I mean, you and I talked about your microtask ideas and we, I, I sort of said, so where does this, where does this leave the human? Like, at the end of the day, and we had an interesting conversation on this, and it's really the fundamental question that we all probably have is, all right, this is really all interesting, but who, who are we in this whole thing? So where do you think, you know, what would you tell your kids to study and be ready for for the future that's gonna matter in 30 years? Uh, because that's really the game afoot here. Yeah, no, and I think it's a great question to think about sort of where we're going as workers. And I think uh, crowdsourcing and crowd platforms are a really interesting place. It's a lot where a lot of the data for machine learning is collected as well. And um, a lot of what it looks like to be a crowd worker right now isn't very appealing. And you have to think about like, why would I want my child to grow up and be a crowd worker? Uh, and so thinking, when you start thinking about exploding a task and coming up with a structure, it actually starts to look a lot like what crowd workers do. And a lot of the structure for tasks that we have right now, how to organize content into a hierarchy, how to plan trips, those sort of things, uh, that structure comes from successful crowd workflows that we've built. Changing selling into success measuring and improving, that'll have an effect on the software that we all generate, the models that we use, as well as the data sets that we care about.